watching the Myrtle Beach Invitational, part of Feast Week, presented by Lowe's from the HTC Center on the campus of Coastal Carolina University. It's the West Virginia Mountaineers taking on the St. Joseph's Hawks for third place in the tournament. Here's a look at your brackets. The Hawks won a game by 20, then they lost by that margin to UCF in the semifinals, and the Mountaineers losing a hard-fought contest to Western Kentucky two nights ago. And that sets the stage for this afternoon. Welcome in, everybody, alongside Debbie Antonelli. I'm Rich Hollenberg, and Debbie, for St. Joe's, we are about to see one of the prolific point producers in the early part of this season. You like offense? I do. I do, too. So if you love to watch a great offensive player, you're going to see one in St. Joe's today. Charlie Brown is 6'7". He's a sophomore. He can score at all three levels. He fills it up outside the arc. This is a team that makes 10 threes a game. And he also can get to the free throw line. They run some isolation for him, but most of what he gets is on his own and his ability to read the defense. And Debbie, big news for West Virginia. They are missing the leader of their team, James Beetle Bolden, missing today's game with an injured elbow. That means they are without their point guard. Well, 40 turnovers in the last two games. So defensively, I'm not worried about Beetle Bolden not playing, but on the offensive end, He's a guy that can help them get in rhythm, and I do not think that West Virginia has figured out on the offensive end what kind of tempo they want to play with. Jermaine Haley will take his place in the starting rotation. Sagaba Kanate, the opening tip, but it's St. Joe's in their road reds controlling that opening tip. Your officials this afternoon, Les Jones, Lee Cassell, and Barry Mathis. Third place on the line in the Myrtle Beach Invitational. 33 in red, that's Taylor Funk. He has been the best shooter in this tournament so far, going 10 for 12 from beyond the arc. You'll see St. Joe's, their style's a lot of five out, and they like to dribble drive. And this guy right here, number two, keep your eye on him, Charlie Brown. He's a tough check for anybody on St. Joe's schedule. First rebound of the game to Kanate. We talked to head coach Phil Martelli. He told us number one on his scouting report against West Virginia is rebound the basketball. There's a nice pass to start the game and West Virginia on the board first. They're gonna switch on Charlie Brown and they're gonna try to keep ball pressure on him. Uh, what West Virginia switching on everything right now. And Taylor Funk picks up where he left off, make it 11 for 13 from distance in this tournament. Absolutely incredible. Three consecutive games. St. Joe's has started with a three. That's a big part of their DNA. As I mentioned, they make 10 threes a game. They love that five out. They all can shoot it. Big size differential at the point with Bynum, number three, the freshman, trying to check Jermaine Haley. Kanate had it partially blocked. Here comes Brown for the Hawks in the open court. And it's an empty possession for St. Joe's. Harler catching fire, and he's got a triple. In the West rhythm. Virginia native, Chase Harler. But then he lets St. Joe's blow right by him in transition. Well, we are being treated to a coaching matchup. Phil Martelli on the left, Bob Huggins on the right. We are talking about 61 combined years of head coaching. And Deb, this is the first time they've ever faced each other in a game. It's amazing too, isn't it? That you could uh, be in the same region and not play against each other. Uh, St. Joe's, obviously a part of the A-10. West Virginia was in the A-10. Then they were in the Big East. Now, of course, the Big 12, but they never played against each other until today. Yeah, they were rivals for 13 seasons from 82-83 to 94-95. Of course, Bob Huggins in his 12th year at his alma mater, West Virginia. He had the Mountaineers in the Big East before they moved to the Big 12. Two free throws by Lamar Kimball, one of the best nicknames in the country. Fresh, they call him. He's got the two free throws, and now we have another West Virginia turnover, which you commented on in the beginning. What are St. Joe's winning strategies today? Well, I think they've got to make 13 threes, and they're going to welcome the pressure that West Virginia is going to make because they can score on the back side of it. They also have to rebound and run and attack the second level and make some triples. That's why I think they're going to make 13. And West Virginia, they've got to get points in the paint, establish Kanate inside, and look to make the easy pass. You don't have to go for the home run pass. Let's hit singles to start the game and try to get in rhythm. 
No call on that last play. It'll be West Virginia basketball. And Jermaine Haley, number 10 in white, who's controlling the point. Some high praise from Bob Huggins before the season started. He said he thinks he could be similar to how Deshaun Butler was back in the final four days. I think if Bob Huggins make the, makes a comparison to anybody that had great play for him, that's an incredible um, expectation and one that you should try to live up to. There's Lamar Kimball with his fifth point of the afternoon. He's got five of St. Joe's eight, and the Hawks are up one three minutes in. Well, good dig from behind by Bynum. A steal by St. Joe's, another turnover for the Mountaineers. Here's Brown, and he's got his first points of the afternoon. Charlie Brown Jr. with a triple. All that length and athleticism gets nullified as West Virginia turns the ball over because St. Joe's can get up the court and knock down triples. You can't you said, catch up and recover to that risk. Sorry, Deb, you said they had to make 13. They made three already yep. three minutes in. 13 to win. Inside to Kanate, working on long prey. Can't get it to go, Brown the rebound. At least Kanate has started a game with three touches on the block where he has the ability to overpower. Brown all the way to the dish, weaving through the West Virginia defense. To me, that's what makes him so hard to guard, right? We already see the transition three, and then you come with a long closeout, and his length and his first step gets by the D. St. Joe's in the midst of an 8-0 run. Harler trying to end it. He can't with the three, and St. Joe's comes away with it. Take to the cup by Taylor Funk. And we have our first timeout, 15-38 to go. St. Joe's off to a hot shooting start. They're up by six on the Mountaineers. ESPN's exclusive presentation of college basketball is brought to you by Visit Myrtle Beach. Relax and unwind on Myrtle Beach time. Well, this is what's been plaguing the West Virginia Mountaineers in the early part of the season. Turnovers leading to buckets by the opposition. Yeah, look at the transition ability to get up the court. Charlie Brown spots up behind the arc. Three for three outside the three-point line as St. Joe's early in the game. Two turnovers for West Virginia. And look at this, Rich. Only three teams in the entire country in Division I turn a ball over more than West Virginia. Yeah, coming into this tournament, Bob Huggins told us the biggest problem with the team is they throw it to the other team too much. And that's continued again today. Well, coming up uh, this week from Lahaina Civic Center in Maui, it's the Maui Gym Maui Invitational. Monday's games starting on ESPN2, number nine Auburn against Xavier, number one Duke against San Diego State, and waiting at the other half of the bracket, the number three Gonzaga Bulldogs. That is a loaded field on ESPN this coming week. You know, I gotta believe Coach Huggins is going to try to build confidence today, not necessarily get too upset. I don't think West Virginia is gonna turn the ball over 22 times tonight. I just would have a hard time believing that that would be the case, even without Beetle Bolden. They get Kanate a touch, he's doubled in the post. And he fights through it for his second bucket of the game. So basically you throw it in there and that's his fourth touch on the block and you say guard it, okay? And I think St. Joe's is gonna to struggle to guard Kanate inside. Kanate had his hands full Friday night against a super freshman Charles Bassey. We'll see Bassey in the Western Kentucky Hilltoppers in the championship game. Kimball with the ball, gets fouled. That's the second foul on Chase Harler. Harler, a West Virginia native, playing for his hometown school. And you could say the same for Lamar Kimball, a Philly kid. Six-foot redshirt junior out of Newman Goretti High School. That's a walk. Here's Kimball, zero in red. Trying to work on Harler. Pull up Jay. Too strong. I don't think St. Joe's needs to take contested shots like that. You got to get a ball reversal. That's one thing Coach Martelli was saying. The more he sees the ball moving from side to side, the better off the offense will be. Kanate got the foul, and Sagaba Kanate will go to the line. You're going to see 
St. Joe's dig in, sometimes double. They're going to change up their looks, but that's the fifth touch for Kanate inside. And you remember we were talking about how he's been drifting out to the perimeter. Well, now he's going back on the inside, and this is what he can do on the defensive end. But on the offensive end, he is terrific at getting a good post up with his back to the basket and earning a trip to the line. He absolutely is one of the most feared defenders in all of Division I basketball. But expanding his offensive game, as you said, is something that's critical for him to go to the next level. Well, it, it, it's you're talking about multi, multi-millions of dollars, right? Mm -hmm. Move your feet on the perimeter, guard in the two-man game, knock down triples, and if you can hit the corner three, which I don't think he'll be in the corner that much, he's got to be able to hit the trail three. And if he can do that, that's going to add to Coach Huggins' offensive options. Two free throws by Kanate make it a two-point game. St. Joe's handles the Press Virginia pressure with ease. Pull-up jumper off the mark. And Emmett Matthews, 11 and white, making his first appearance of the game, grabs a rebound. Charlie Brown's gone up the floor a couple times without a touch. See? Kanate again, eight points in the early going yep. for Sagaba Kanate. It's not a hard fix, right? It's a very simple formula for West Virginia. And I think right here for St. Joe's, they need to look at Charlie Brown as well. And Taylor Funk showing he's not a one-trick pony. Not just threes for Funk, he has five now. Well, you've got to play him to put the ball on the floor. That trip to the free throw line, the last couple of possessions was his first trip to the line all season. Harris had it blocked from behind. Matthews has a chance at a three-point play. That's the first points of the season for Emmett Matthews Jr., the 6'7 freshman out of Tacoma. Coach Hug is getting deeper into his bench with some early minutes right here. Good job going to the rim. Not getting a lot of playing time in this tournament, but certainly getting a chance right now to get to the stripe. This is a learning time for all coaches and their teams, obviously. We're only in mid-November depth, but Sagaba Kanate and Chase Harler, the two veteran players on this West Virginia team with Beetle Bolden out with an injury, are both on the bench now. Who do you think takes over for West Virginia with them riding the bench? Well, I think Napper would like to be able to be in charge of the point a little bit. He got early minutes in the game yesterday, or excuse me, on Friday against Western Kentucky. Taylor Funk having a productive first half. He has seven, including one triple. And St. Joe's on top by one, 13, 12 to go. And that's Francesco Oliva, who, as hesitant as Phil Martelli is to give labels to players, says he could be a point forward. They can run their offense through him. You know, typical European player, right? He can handle up front. It's a posi positionless basketball that is starting to come over to the United States. Matthews, nice touch from the elbow. Look, Matthews has taken advantage of an opportunity. He's not afraid to come in here and try to make a play. Oliva out to Funk. Here's Brown alone in the corner, and he knocks it down. Charlie Brown has been as advertised with eight points. You know, and, and he is patiently waiting for the offense to come to him. He is not been upset about the ball going around the, the rim and not or around the horn not touching his hands at all I didn't say that very well but what I mean is he's being patient about his offense I knew what you meant there's another triple and they are five for five St. Joe's is showing why they could be so dangerous this year in the Atlantic 10 well they were picked to finish second in that league Kimball with eight Brown with eight, Funk with seven. Balanced scoring for Phil Martelli's Hawks. Logan Rout called for the traveling, and that's the third turnover of the afternoon for Bob Huggins Mountaineers. We have a timeout on the floor. Here's a three by St. Joe's again. They are hot right now from beyond the arc.
St. Joe's has led from the jump, 23-18 here at the Myrtle Beach Invitational, playing for third place, 11.59 to go in the first half. Tuesday on ESPN, we'll have the exclusive reveal of the next college football playoff top 25 rankings. That's at 7 Eastern. Reese and the guys breaking them down from top to bottom, have coaches' reactions as well as a live interview with new committee chairman Rob Mullins. You can always watch live on the ESPN app from anywhere. And if you know Debbie Antonelli like I know Debbie Antonelli, <laughs> I have to say, I'm a little surprised that you weren't named the chairman of that committee. <laughs> I'm ready if you're they the, call you're on You're the chairman me. of every other committee in the NCAA that I <laughs> no. know. No, I don't want any more responsibility, Rich. <laughs> I, I, I love being your partner. Let's just leave it at that right here. Keep it simple, right? Well, if Condoleezza Rice is going to interview for the Browns head coaching job, I'll I mean, tell you come what. on, I might, you might as well. I mean, I can be... I'd love to be in charge of the NCAA tournament. There, there's out of the box, and then there's out of the box. That one partially blocked by Lamont West, and Les Jones says he contacted him. So Jared Bynum will go to the line and shoot two. You know, the one thing I love about watching these two coaches and studying their systems, you know, with, with Bob Huggins, you know you're going to get the pressure, okay? He's going to bring full court pressure. He's going to change up how they bring it. Sometimes it's a run and jump. They will keep their defensive schemes changing. And Phil Martelli, you, you don't prepare the day before when you play West Virginia. You prepare with your concepts defensively as soon as you hit the preseason. So it's not like all of a sudden you're shocked that West Virginia's got length and they're going to press. The difference is simulating it is hard to do because it's so athletic and long. A couple of old school head coaches. They didn't do a whole lot of fun stuff on their day off here in Myrtle Beach. I asked them both, what'd you do in the uh, time off? And he said, we practiced. That's what we yeah, did. No putt-putt or anything like right, that, right? Make the most of your time here. Somebody had to hit one of these pancake houses. Francesco doing a great job of taking it strong to the rim. Nobody stops the ball. So far, the story of the game has been St. Joe's and their ability to knock down the three-pointer five for five so far. But they've been taking it to the cup as well. That's the one thing that you love about the St. Joe's bigs. They shoot the three. They play the five out because they can handle. They can go off the bounce. And besides dribble penetration, guarding in transition is the toughest thing to defend. Napper from the corner, in and out. Offensive rebound by Kanate. Muscled it up, but it wouldn't go for him. Well, he's playing with that high motor rim to rim right now, isn't he? Kanate really working for position inside. Oliva short on the three, and here comes Napper in transition. Emmett Matthews, 11 and white, getting some extended minutes today. And now it's Kanate feeding the post instead of getting paint touches himself. Well, I don't mind Matthews inverting to the block when you've got a smaller defender on you. It's a good recognition by Kanate to feed him inside on the repost. I think that's really hard to guard. So we have Kanate. Back to the basket, getting great quality touches in the paint. And now he's got a mismatch with a smaller player. You try to help. Look how strong he is to still be able to get that to the rim. One dribble move. No stepping in on charge on that, man. No way. No one wants to rotate on that. A good free throw shooter. He's perfect from the stripe so far today. Three for three has nine points. And Emmett Matthews Jr. gets a well-deserved hand from the Mountaineer faithful who have come out in full force this tournament. And Jordan McCabe checking in for the first time. I think it was a combination cheer for Matthews Jr. And uh, the fans are looking for Jordan McCabe to see what he can do. Jordan McCabe, an ESPN top 100 recruit. It's been a top 25 class that Bob Huggins is brought in, and they're so deep, he's still trying to figure out who can break into the rotation. Here's another three. That's the first miss from beyond the arc. 
Check that, their second miss this afternoon. All alone, West for three. Got it. Really good decision. Good pass by Kanate. Three threes for West Virginia, and they've tied the game up at 26. And an errant pass by Oliva out of bounds. West Virginia with a chance to take the lead. And you pick up your dribble, and you're left stuck too far away from the basket, and, and West Virginia does a great job of denying one pass away. Good pass by Kanate, wide open West in the corner. And if anybody needed to see a big basket today, it's Lamont West. Yeah, he's pulled from the starting lineup. He's really struggled his first few games this season. There's West missing with that three. And Kimball with the look up ahead. And Edwards with the slam. Lorenzo Edwards with his first two. And Harris called for the traveling violation. That's turnover number four for the Mountaineers. Watch Kimball off the bounce, one-handed pass, perfect to Lorenzo Edwards to finish. You get an easy basket like that, that's gotta give you a little momentum if you're St. Joe's, because you're constantly going under duress against the West Virginia D. They count the basket from Fresh Kimball and he's in double digits with a chance to add to it the and one. Jordan McCabe struggling keeping Kimball in front. So what happens for Sate to have to have? I'm surprised he didn't try to block that instead of going for a, a charge. Kimball 75% from the stripe in the early part of the season. If you can't keep your man in front, you force rotation, and that is going to help St. Joe's because they like to shoot the three, so they'll reverse the basketball and get an uncontested three. Kanate wants a touch, he gets it, and he's immediately double teamed in the post. And he lost it. Five turnovers for West Virginia. They bring the double from ball side, and Charlie Brown rotates over to take away the pass on the strong side. A rare miss for Funk from beyond the arc. Here's Kanate. West, another three. And the official stop play with 8.17 to go. And now Andrew Gordon, number 12 in white, will take Sags Kanate's place on the floor. Uh, really good first start, first half for Kanate. Establishes himself on the baseline. Two feet in the paint, really tough to guard. He's also a willing passer out of the double team. More substitutions, number 12 in red. Anthony Longpre checking in, as does the freshman point guard, Jared Bynum, for Phil Martelli. So it's two freshmen. McCabe guarding Bynum. Funk, step back, pretty. Boy, that was a beautiful play. One strong dribble to the elbow, little fade away. He wasn't shooting it all that well to start the season, and Phil Martelli joked with him, as sarcastic as Coach Martelli could be, he said, hey, when your parents come to Myrtle Beach to watch you play, make sure they bring your jump shot with you. <laughs> well, they brought it. To one more, Harris passed it up. Five on the shot clock. Here's Napper, and it's an air ball, shot clock violation. And that will not please Bob Huggins. 32-29, St. Joe's with 7.28 to go. Can't let the ball get stuck on one side of the floor because if you do and turn it over, this is what St. Joe's can do. Taylor Funk is not in a shooting funk in this tournament.
back in beautiful Myrtle Beach. We're actually at the HTC Center on the campus of Coastal Carolina University, where St. Joe's hanging on to a three-point lead over the West Virginia Mountaineers with 7.28 to go. Rich Hollenberg, Debbie Antonelli, and we came into this game, Deb, bemoaning the fact that Bob Huggins Mountaineers had turned the ball over an average of 20 times per game. It made it even worse to find out that Beetle Bolden, their point guard, is going to miss this game with an elbow injury, and yet, so far, they've only turned it over six times. And we were saying that's pretty good for West Virginia considering what they've been doing. So are you looking for this team to show a little maturity? If Bob Huggins is trying to find out something about his group, he's finding something out in the first half. There are plenty of people that can manage the offense at the top of the floor. Now who can take care of the basketball? Because they're shooting the ball pretty well, especially outside the arc where they're 50%. Funk off the mark again. They've missed their last four three-pointers. Harris knocks down another three. So now West Virginia has heated up from beyond the arc. They've hit five triples. And here comes a change of defense, a trap at midcourt. And Press Virginia shows itself. It was a good change by Bob Huggins, just to affect the rhythm of the game. And you know what's interesting? Everybody was freaking out when West Virginia lost to Buffalo at home. It was their worst home loss in, what, almost 20 years. And yet, in that game, Beetle Bolden went out toward the end of the game, Deb, and it seemed like West Virginia was rattled and couldn't shake that. In this game, without Bolden, it seems like they've responded back. I, I think they're learning the things that all young teams have to learn, especially when you have a big change at the point where you don't have Javon Carter. You want to play fast, ramped up, excited on the defensive end, but then you've got to learn how to slow that down a little bit offensively. I think that's part of the problem why they turn the ball over so much. Here's an NBA three from the freshman Jared Bynum, his first field goal of the game. And that puts St. Joe's up by 335-32 with 6.20 to go. 2-3 zone. West. A little heat check, maybe. Lamont West has his third three of the first half. Well, without Kanate on the floor, you might as well shoot the threes now, right? Because as soon as he comes back in, that's the difference for West Virginia, that he can get on the block and they can throw it in there and he can score. Brown. Wow. Can you top this? <laughs> Contested three. That's the third triple for Charlie Brown. He has 11. He's all business, isn't he? Averaging 24 a game coming in. Now West. Are you kidding oh. me? Go ahead, Lamont West. You were due. How about the foot fake for a little separation? Both teams getting good looks and taking advantage. Ball goes out of bounds. It's going to stay St. Joseph's basketball. And now we have substitutions coming on for both clubs, but both teams are scorching hot from three-point range. A little hesitation, but Harris doing a nice job of pulling up, sticking that beautiful left-handed jumper. Under pressure, Charlie Brown on the other end. And then Lamont West counters. Charlie Brown at 26 in their opening round game here against Wake Forest. 28 in the semifinals against UCF. And he's off to another terrific start with 11 in this one. Tie ball game coming up on five minutes to go. Long prey. Can't get it to go from in the painted area. And we're going the other way. That's an offensive foul on Taylor Funk. And so now with West Virginia in the bonus, they'll be shooting one and one. Phil Martelli has won 20 more games nine times in his 24 years. He's got 433 wins all with this St. Joe's team. He is Philadelphia through and through. Yeah, again. he is iconic in the Philadelphia area and regionally. I mean, the Big Five is still alive. Don't you love the Big Five? That's right. Big fan of that. They'll take on Temple and Villanova coming up. And they're going to take on Loyola Chicago, Final Four team a year ago, at the Palestra 
at the end of December. West knocks them both down. 14 points for Lamont West. And it's a two-point West Virginia lead. Blocked by Kanate. Nice interior passing. And a chance at a three-point play. Checo Oliva will go to the line. Oliva, watch this. He gets the double pump fake right here. There's one. Here comes another. Gets Sagaba Kanate in the air. Tough bucket by really Francesco good. Oliva. Really good finish inside. St. Joseph's got to shoot free throws better. They only make 12 a game. Kanate grabs it. He got fouled and almost had a chance at a three-point play. You know, this whole tournament, you and I have been laying out the shot chart for Kanate, right? As in points in the paint versus outside the arc. The quality of his touch today on the inside has been outstanding. It's been block to block. It's been with his back to the basket. When he has been a face-up player with a ball in his hands, he's looked to pass. I think Bob Huggins, he told us the other day, he knows how hard. Kanate has worked on his perimeter game and his shooting the three, and he loves that about his work ethic. But this is what West Virginia needs right now is for him to score in the paint. Then pull your game away. Yeah. And Bob Huggins is very sensitive to the fact that he knows Kanate's going to play at the next level. He developed Javon Carter's game. Javon Carter is having a great first year with the Memphis Grizzlies when a lot of people question whether he'd be able to contribute at the NBA level. So he is sensitive. He will let Kanate shoot from beyond the arc, but at the end of the day, what matters most is what's best for the team. And you play Buffalo, and you go three for four outside the three-point line, and right. now you think you're a three-point shooter. You could fall in love with it a little bit, understandable. Well, you know, I say there's a big difference between being a three-point shooter and making a few threes. Okay, Kanate has made a few threes. Right. Well, he started out, what, you said three for four. He's four for 12 now. Phil Martelli, a little incredulous at that last call as Jermaine Haley brings it up with a chance to put West Virginia on top again. They've led just once in this first half with four minutes to go. Haley had his pocket picked and a foul called. And there's a little bit of inexperience showing for Jermaine Haley at the point. Well, you got to tighten up that bounce when you got 5'10", Jared Bynum in front of you. Sagaba Kanate sitting on the bench with under four minutes to go. West Virginia shot the three well early. They got a one-point lead. ESPN's exclusive presentation of college basketball is brought to you by Lowe's. Hurry in today for huge Black Friday savings. We have been treated to a three-point barrage here on the final Sunday for Myrtle Beach. You know I'm perfectly fine with that. Both these teams can shoot till their arm falls off as far as I'm concerned. I thought St. Joe's was great in transition. They scored early. Charlie Brown was a factor. We haven't heard Charlie Brown's name in a little while. And then West Virginia, Chase Harler got him started, but they've made seven for 12 outside the arc as well. And Lamont West has been fantastic. He is four for five outside the three-point line. Four of those seven threes, and that's what's gotten West Virginia back in it. But interesting to know, we've kept an eye on Sags Kanate all tournament long. And yes, we talked about the fact that he can shoot the three, but Kanate's touches have been closer to the basket. You feel like that could be a key down the stretch. I think that could be the difference because they can trade baskets back and forth, but when you get into the second half and Kanate has got to stay out of foul trouble, you know, he already has two fouls. He pr we probably won't see him the rest of the half. I don't think St. Joe's can guard him inside. And they can't guard Andrew Gordon either. The reserve big man gets a bucket and plus one. You know, to me, this is West Virginia basketball, right? Throw it in the block, try to guard it, punch him in the mouth. 
and try to stick it right off the glass. And Kanate is good, and he'll be an NBA player, but young Andrew Gordon is an athletic freak. He didn't pick up the sport of basketball until he was a senior in high school at Dunedin High School in the Tampa Bay area, and he took it on as a dare from one of his family members, <laughs> and now all of a sudden he's playing Big 12 basketball for Bob Huggins. So this is his third year of organized basketball? Yes, and he is a dynamite Amazing. football player. And Napper's going to be called for the hand check foul. I love that Coach Martelli has confidence in Bynum to invert him, or excuse me, the Kimball to invert him to the block. That's somebody that you trust, right? Coming off the timeout, this is a guy who didn't score against UCF, had a struggle, kind of struggled from the floor. Yeah, five turnovers in that game. Yeah, he, he just didn't control the ground like he usually does for Phil Martelli. And then he puts him off a timeout in that position and, and knowing you've got Charlie Brown on the floor. You know, it might not be the sexiest thing to talk about, Deb, but free throws telling a story here in the first half. St. Joe's has gotten to the line as many times as West Virginia, but they've only made four of those ten, now five of 11 from the strike. And it, isn't it kind of ironic? A good three-point shooting team doesn't shoot free throws well. <laughs> it's just that they don't get enough reps. Sometimes you live by the three, you die by the three. Right now, West Virginia with the ball and a one-point lead. And the foul's going to go on Brown, so that'll send the Mountaineers to the line. And it's double bonus time, so the Mountaineers, and in this case, Wesley Harris in particular, will be shooting two. So Charlie Brown with two fouls, and... You know, the next possession is going to be an offensive possession for St. Joe's. I like leaving him on the floor. As long as you're going to run something through him or the player. Not, I'm not saying Coach Martelli doesn't have a package for Charlie Brown. The way they run five out, I would believe that the guys on the floor would try to get him a touch right here. Well, he's got 11 points, three for three, but you mentioned it a couple moments ago. Haven't called his name much in the last few minutes. You know, and that's the brilliance of what Phil Martelli does. It's that he knows he's got a featured player, but he also understands why balance is important. And right on the spot, Brown took it to the length of the floor, but had it blocked. And there's Fresh Kimball with the putback. 14 points for Lamar Kimball, and that puts St. Joe's back on top with a timeout on the floor, 44-43. But, Deb, don't sleep on those Iowa State Cyclones. Yeah. Lindell Wigginton and Nick Weiler Babb and company. And how about these Duke Blue Devils? Another couple of stiff contests coming up from Hawaii if things go to form in that tournament. I would love to see if the teams advance that are projected to advance, Duke and Auburn. I would really be intrigued by that matchup on Tuesday night at 8 o'clock on ESPN. Duke also has Indiana on their schedule, Romeo Langford and company. That'll be a fun one. Auburn co-champions of the SEC last year, and they have basically everyone back. Jordan McCabe, number five, knocks down the three-pointer with five left on the shot clock. And West Virginia back on top. Four different Mountaineers have knocked down at least one three-pointer today. There's the freshman Bynum, the only freshman on Phil Martelli's roster, getting significant playing time. This now is he a clear out. He's going to call for it. Here comes a step-up screen. Five to shoot. Kimball does, and it's off to the left and out of bounds. There was no space there for Kimball to drive. I think he wants that matchup against McCabe. McCabe inside, Ahmad spins, and a foul's called, and it looked like Issa Ahmad took one right to the kisser. Haven't called Issa Ahmad's name yet this afternoon. Held scoreless in the first half, and he came in averaging 14 a game. You know, 
St. Joe's has picked up several fouls digging in or doubling on the block. And that's the way they play inside. You know, Coach Martelli's always trying to bring two to the box. But to your point about Ahmad, he's over there. Uh, looks like he's got a bloody nose trying to get the blood to stop so he can go to the free throw line. Oh, yeah. Looked like that's a double a, shot there. Yeah, that's a tough one. And Ahmad, because of that bloody nose, is not able to shoot the free throws, so they'll send Chase Harler to the line in his place. So Bob Huggins can pick who he wants. Right. Harler, the 6'3 junior, out of Moundsville, West Virginia. Two-time West Virginia Gatorade Player of the Year coming in, but very much a role player in his yeah. first two seasons in Morgantown. This season... A lot more being asked from Bob Huggins. And I think he is capable of delivering a little bit more. He, he likes to play him off the ball. He usually guards one of the better perimeter players. I think he's really good in rotations on the back row. And, he's, and he talks on defense. It's a really important key. He communicates. Those two free throws set up the full court pressure. West Virginia up four with a buck 24 to go. Inside, Oliva. Back outside, and another three, this time by number three, Jared Bynum. And he has seven. Ball didn't hit the floor against the trap. They moved it, good skip pass, wide open. St. John, St. Joe's eight for 14 from three in the first half, as we're under a minute to go. You gotta come with a long closeout right here. He's got the hot hand. Good ball movement. West has his fifth three of the first half. Go ahead, Lamont West. You are overdue. You shoot till your arm falls off. 11 second differential between the shot clock and the game clock as we wind down this first half. Nice backdoor cut by Kimball. 16 in the first half for Lamar Kimball. That's what you call sleeping and ball watching. That won't look pretty on film tomorrow. High scoring, high level basketball in the first half of this consolation game from the Myrtle Beach Invitational. It's last shot time for West Virginia. McCabe, no. Let's see if St. Joe's can get one off. They do, it's off to the left and break with a two point game. West Virginia leads it by two, 51-49. Both teams shooting lights out from beyond the arc, including Charlie Brown and Lamar Kimball, who leads all scorers with 16. We'll go to the studio for the halftime report after these messages. We're back at halftime of the Myrtle Beach Invitational, the consolation round between the West Virginia Mountaineers of the Big 12 and the St. Joseph's Hawks of the Atlantic 10. A reminder that next year's field for Myrtle Beach has already been announced, and once again, it is an impressive one. Baylor will be the Big 12 represented. Coastal Carolina, the Chanticleers are actually gonna be the home team. That's rare, but it is happening in 2019. Penny Hardaway is gonna bring his Memphis Tigers in, as is Ben Howland's Mississippi State Bulldogs, and of course, highlighting the 2019 field, the Villanova Wildcats of the Big East. So that is something to look forward to. We have the second half to look forward to between the Mountaineers and the Hawks. Keep it right here. We're at halftime. We'll get you ready for the second half after this. South Carolina, part of Feast Week, presented by Lowe's, Rich Hollenberg, Debbie Antonelli. It was a very entertaining first half here between West Virginia and St. Joe's. The Mountaineers lead it by two, and both of these teams play defense. We know West Virginia prides themselves on their defense, but both teams shot exceptionally <laughs> well from beyond the arc in the first I mean, half. A lot of open threes, transition threes, threes off a kick, very few contested triples. St. Joe's loves to shoot the three. They average 10 a game. They did a nice job in transition, especially early on when West Virginia turned it over. And they did a nice job of moving the ball and getting open looks 
And for West Virginia, hey, listen now, that's all about West Virginia's defense. Well, today their three kept them in the game here and helped, actually helped them to a two-point lead. I thought they did a great job of spacing the floor. And part of the reason, Rich, why the spacing on the floor is better for West Virginia is because Sagaba Kanate is inside on the block playing his natural role, which allows everyone else to play their role. There are 16 ties and 10 lead changes in the first half. What do you feel like is going to be the key to the second half, and what could be the difference maker? I think the difference could be Sagaba Kanate. Look, nobody, not many, have anybody that looks like him in college basketball. And look at his shot chart from the first half. Points in the paint, catches in the paint, and he's able to facilitate through the double team as well. I think he plays with a high IQ, and I think he showed that he wants to win, and that's why he's gone back on the inside to play his natural position. Good first half for Kanate, 11.6 boards, and West Virginia has the lead and the ball to start the second half. Third place on the line, both of these teams one and one in the Myrtle Beach Invitational. And immediately, Kanate gets a touch, and he's double teamed. Ball goes out of bounds. It'll stay Mountaineers basketball. So I thought West Virginia's details were really good in the first half, better than we've seen all tournament. But that pass right there, you've got to get the right angle to get that ball inside to him, knowing that he's going to get doubled. Jermaine Haley, 10 and white for West Virginia, getting the start and starting the second half at the point guard position. The big story before the game, James Beadle Bolden, one of the leaders for this Mountaineers club, missing today's game with an elbow injury. But so far, 51 points in the first half. You can't argue with that. You can't. It's their rhythm. They've taken better care of the basketball. Only eight first half turnovers. There's gets... Bolden on the bench in the shooting shirt. And what's even more curious, they scored 51 points without Issa Mod getting a bucket at all. And he was the leading scorer for this team coming in, averaging over 14 a game. And we've been talking about the West Virginia depth, you know, for the entire tournament. And, and Bob Huggins went to his bench early in the first half. And I think he's building confidence with this group. You know, they know that they turn the ball over too much. They got to understand why they've turned it over and not make the same mistake twice. They've averaged over 20 turnovers a game. And there's Charlie Brown starting off with the backdoor cut. And they're going to tee him up because he slapped the backboard after the dunk. Terrific backdoor cut, and that has to drive Phil Martelli crazy. Well, right out of the locker room. Look at this. Nice play. The dunk. So that'll send Chase Harler to the free throw line to shoot the tech. Great piece of execution. Then you see he just decided to slap the backboard for a little emphasis, and that's not allowed. And we saw on that opening possession exactly what Phil Martelli loves so much about having Checo Oliva on the floor is the offense can run through him, and he had a beautiful pass back door to Brown to start the second half. So West Virginia gets the extra free throw and the ball up by two. And Phil Martelli isn't all about drawing up plays. He's about teaching concepts and about allowing his players the freedom to make a play. Harris off to the left on the three, but Ahmad chases it down in a fresh 30 for the Mountaineers. Ahmad, aggressive, too strong. And here comes the freshman Bynum. Another backdoor cut. Oliva got the foul, and he'll go to the line. Unless it looks like Les Jones might have called that on the floor. What a terrific adjustment in game out of the locker room by Phil Martelli's club. We haven't seen any backdoor cuts. They go to their five out. They space the floor. In the first two possessions of the second half, they get a backdoor look. And we were remarking how through the first two and a half games of this tournament, they had almost as many threes taken as they did two-point field goals. So far, they're coming out intent on attacking the basket. And you could tell that's not necessarily Oliva's strong suit. <laughs> that's Sagaba Kanate right there lurking. And he even had a little smile on his face. 
And a little bit of a Bronx cheer from the hey, Mountaineer faithful. You're going to finger roll that thing near the cup. That thing's going in the fifth row. Kanate spins and hits. Beautiful. And he spins away from where the help was coming. Pro move. Smart. I'm telling you, the IQ is on display with this back to the basket. Good job by Kimball using the basket for protection, but he missed the layup nonetheless. Wide open, the lefty, and Harris can't convert. West Virginia has to be careful not collectively to fall in love with the three. That's right. They, they, especially when Kanate is starting to feel it a little bit because this is what St. Joe's counters with. Well, set shot three from the diminutive point guard, Jared Bynum, 5'10", 172 out of Largo, Maryland. They're now nine for 15 from beyond the arc. Okay, that's a rhythm and a timing mistake. That comes with playing together, you know, figuring it out. And Harler's gonna get that turnover, but when Coach Huggins looks at it, that's gonna be Haley's turnover. Bynum, the one more to Funk. And he knocks that down. Second three of the afternoon for Taylor Funk, and he's got a dozen. He has had a terrific tournament. Here's Harler, three from the corner. Not this time. So you got Charlie Brown matched up on Sagaba Kanate with two fouls. You got to throw the ball inside to Sags. You got to put some pressure on Charlie Brown on the defensive end. Well, that Taylor Funk three gave St. Joe's a 57-55 lead. That marks the 11th lead change of the game. We've seen high-level basketball, and it's been a seesaw battle. Real fun to watch here this afternoon for Myrtle Beach. You can not say pointing where he wants the ball and the pass to come from. He's got to shape up a little bit to the basketball on the top as well. Harler. A rhythm three from Chase Harler, his second triple. Nine for him. You know, I mentioned it a couple of times, and it's really a valid point about Coach Huggins and what he's done with his team. By putting Sags back on the block, it changes the spacing for everyone else. Look at the St. Joe's D collapse around him. That's why Harler's wide open. Seven to shoot for St. Joe's. Now three on the clock. Kimball tried to do it himself, came up empty. And we've got a whistle that stops play with 15.36 to go. Well, make a three, miss a three, it doesn't matter. The St. Joe's Hawk will be flapping his wings all the time. We'll have more on that when we return. ESPN's exclusive presentation of college basketball is brought to you by Lowe's. Hurry in today for huge Black Friday savings. Oh, even a Hawk needs a drink once in a while, right? 57-58, St. Joe's down by one. But it doesn't matter what the score is. That is Dominic Godshaw. He is the 39th iteration of the St. Joe's Hawk mascot, one of the most iconic mascots in all of college sports. And yes, he does not stop flapping his wings the entire game, even during timeouts, even during halftime. He debuted 63 seasons ago against a fellow Philadelphia school in LaSalle, and he hasn't stopped flapping his wings since. I love it. I think it's one of the great college traditions. Very yeah. intricate system that they have. Someone who has a grease <laughs> board keeps track. Someone with his iPhone is watching every step and every flap that Dominic Godshaw makes. There's Issa Ahmad with another two out of the timeout. What a feed by Kanate. 
First bucket of the game for Ahmad, and that puts West Virginia up by three. Coming up on five minutes gone by in the second half. Charlie Brown still on the floor with those three fouls. And here he is with the ball, two in red. And he came close to drawing his fourth. I think Phil Martelli really trusts Charlie Brown. I mean, how are you going to beat West Virginia if you got your best offensive player sitting on the bench with three fouls, right? I mean, you got to believe that he understands, Charlie Brown understands, and he has to stay on the floor for Phil Martelli to come out of here with a W. And he has been good today and the last couple of days, 13 for Charlie Brown as he steps to the line. But here's been a big difference today versus the previous two games here for St. Joe's in the Myrtle Beach Invitational. In their semifinal game against UCF, Brown and Taylor Funk combined for 44 points. The rest of the team combined for 13. Today, much more balanced scoring with Kimball having 16, Jared Bynum in double digits with 10 as well. They only had five players score in that UCF game, and you're right, to Phil Martelli, to your point, Rich, Phil Martelli says, you know, to have a, a balanced team and to feature Charlie Brown, we have to have a combination of everyone scoring. Otherwise, how can we feature him if we don't have balance? There will be, the defenses on him will be so tough he won't be able to shake free, so other guys have got to be able to score. Those two free throws pull St. Joe's back to within one. Mismatch. Kanate had it slapped away from behind, but there's a Modigan who's got the hot hand in the second half. He knows how West Virginia has just gone back to their quarter court man-to-man -man defense. Maybe Bob Huggins wants to be really good in this part of the floor right here. Brown, catch and release. Wow. 18 for Charlie Brown on his fourth triple of the game. Really good rhythm to his jump shot. Kanate, tough shot, baseline. And Funk clears for St. Joe's. Chance to take the lead on a three, no. Oh, see, that's not a smart play by Charlie Brown at all. I can't believe that he's trying to get this tap right here from behind, crashing the glass. That's a foul. And we'll keep an eye on the St. Joe's bench and Charlie Brown. And right now, as you would imagine, Brown with 13.55 to go in a tightly contested game is going to have to sit on the bench for a while. It's going to be a good lesson right here for him to learn. Question is, how long does Phil Martelli keep his leading scorer on the bench? You keep him on the bench as long as this stays within one or two possessions. And it's been that for most of the game. 18 ties, 12 lead changes. Harris, tough shot, contested. And here comes fresh Kimball. Takes it himself off the window. 18 for Lamar, fresh Kimball. For a guy who didn't score a point in the last game, he's had a terrific floor game as well. That's a season high for him. Harler, step back three. That's not a good shot. Not good timing and it allows the breakout by St. Joe's. Bynum missed the trail. As Kimball got the feed from the freshman point guard and missed the bunny at close range. And that's the third foul on Taylor Funk now. This is not a deep St. Joe's team. Now some substitutions for Bob Huggins as Haley and Matthews go to the bench and Brandon Knapper checks in. Andrew Gordon on as well, as is number 15 in white Lamont West. Here's Ahmad, he's been the top scorer for West Virginia in the second half. Knapper, tough shot. First two of the game for Brandon Knapper, the redshirt freshman from out of South Charleston, West Virginia. Rich, don't you get the feeling after watching West Virginia for three games in a row that Coach Huggins has just made it simpler for the guys. He's just made it easier for them to be able to play, to make plays, and to run their stuff and to keep their defensive system. 
and they want a breakaway foul on that one. Good defense by Ahmad to initiate the fast break. And Bob Huggins wants that to be a two-shot foul. Yeah, I think they have to look at it because there was a grab of the arm in transition. And you're right, Deb. They are going to go over and look at this one. The foul was committed by the freshman, Jared Bynum. It's a question of, was it a common foul or a breakaway yeah. foul? He grabbed his arm. Now you're going to watch right here. He pulls his arm, and that, that's, not a, a, that's not necessarily a play on the ball. Watch from this angle. Yeah, he was not making a play on the ball there. I, I think they're going to upgrade it to an F1. And it's interesting to note, when we were talking with Phil Martelli before this game, asking him what his keys to success would be for his team, one, he said rebounding. They're hanging tough with West Virginia in the rebounding department, but the second thing he brought up was no junk fouls. And this could be a big one here in a tie ball game with 12.24 to go. So it will indeed be a flagrant one foul, and that means two shots and the ball for West Virginia. I think it's the right call. It's a good job by the officials to take a look at it. And what's Phil Martelli telling his team right now? You could almost read his lips saying, calm down, right. calm down. I mean, they're fine. Remember, he told us if they can be within... 60 points at the, at the four minute mark. They, they have a chance to win. Here's the keys and winning strategies for the game. They gotta make 13 threes. They already have 11. Okay, they gotta attack the second level of West Virginia's pressure, see? They, they've got to make sure that they are looking to attack, but West Virginia's backed off a little bit. And paint points, Sagaba Kanate has been a factor on the inside and a difference for West Virginia's rhythm and space on the offensive end. St. Joe's actually leading West Virginia 22-18 points in the paint. So Napper goes one for two on the flagrant one foul, and it will be West Virginia basketball with a one-point lead. Well, here's the one thing that I've learned about Sagaba Kanate watching him today is that guy wants to win, okay? He's fine with shooting the three and moving out and working on that part of his game, but today he's gone to the block. He hasn't even looked at going out to the perimeter, and that's because he wants to win. That's why West Virginia will be a special and unique team. And a much more aggressive Issa Ahmad here in the second half than the one we saw in the first half. And all of this, Ted, without their leader and their heart and soul, Beetle Bolden, who's been sidelined with an elbow injury. Why is this West Virginia offense so different with Bolden out versus with Bolden on the floor? Well, he's a terrific three-point shooter, and Coach Huggins likes him actually off the ball. And you think about his role last year. Javon Carter dominated the ball at the point guard position, and Beetle Bolden played off the ball. The only time he would run the point is if Coach Huggins wanted Carter to get a three or to, to make a play off the ball. But I think the biggest difference in the game today doesn't even have anything to do with that, with with Beetle Bolton. I think it has to do with Sagaba Kanate and his attitude, his IQ on the block, his back to the basket play, and the way he changes the space offensively for West Virginia when he's inside. A three point lead for West Virginia, which in this game feels like 13. Oliva. And that's going to be another St. Joe's foul over the top. West Virginia in the bonus. They'll be shooting free throws with a three-point lead and 11.52 to go. So two high-scoring football teams will be on display on Monday Night Football, but we here in Myrtle Beach have two high-scoring basketball teams on the floor. Maybe a little surprising that West Virginia and St. Joe's are racking up the points, but it's 68-64. Both teams shooting lights out from beyond the arc. 11.52 to go, Rich Hollenberg, Debbie Antonelli, the Myrtle Beach Invitational, part of Feast Week, presented by Lowe's. And oh. West Virginia, courtesy of those free throws, Deb, has their largest lead of the game, and it's just five. And here comes their full court pressure. I wanted to say the game feels clean, right? Like shots are going in, nobody's turning the ball over. Good rhythm on the offensive end. Blocked from behind by Kanate, but they're gonna get him for goaltending. I think sometimes that's okay to make that play just from a, an intimidation factor. Send Watch. a message? Yes, absolutely. I didn't see Coach Huggins even flinch on that one. Well, Sags Kanate is 
closing in on the all-time West Virginia blocks record. He'll get that in the next couple of weeks. Good hands by the freshman Bynum tying that up. But they're going to call a foul on Jared Bynum. So we've spent a lot of time talking about Sags on the inside offensively, but last season I watched every one of his block shots on Synergy, and this is the way I charted him. 57% of the shots he blocks, he blocks into West Virginia's transition game. 29% the opponent keeps. 14% he sends into a sports center highlight into the fifth row. I like the 57% because I think that really helps ignite the transition game of West Virginia. Kanate with only one block today, but he has impacted this game. How has he done that? Well, you saw earlier Olivier traveled, right, because he didn't want to throw the finger roll. Um, you, see, you see his impact on the defensive end in terms of their rotation, the way they play up the line. He's a pretty good communicator on the back row as well. And Coach Huggins continues to put long and athletic on the point guards for St. Joseph. Speaking of long, here's a long distance dedication from Long Prey, his first point of the game. He's a very good three point shooter. 12 triples for St. Joe's in the game. Closing in on that 13 that you told us was the magic number. And there's a two hand flush by Kanate. You can see if he's floating around the three point line, he's not able to make that play. Open look, and St. Joe's can't cash it in. He's got to stop the ball. Here's West for three. Make it six three-pointers from Lamont West. It's a much better decision by Lamont West in transition, in rhythm. He had 22 against Buffalo in the season opener. He has 22 today against St. Joe's, and the bulk of them coming from beyond the arc. Lamont West has given West Virginia their largest lead of the game. Anybody interested in a taco in a championship game? <laughs> We've got both coming up when you switch over to ESPN2 at 6.30 Eastern. It'll be Taco Fall, all seven foot six of him, and UCF facing Western Kentucky and freshman sensation Charles Bassey. That'll be for the Myrtle Beach Invitational Championship, and we cannot wait for that one. We've got a great one here in the third place game. West Virginia, 76, St. Joe's, 69, coming up on 10 minutes to go in the game, in the second half. Remember Charlie Brown for St. Joe's with four fouls on the bench. I don't know how much longer Coach Martelli can keep him there, down seven, especially if West Virginia scores on this possession. And you're right, Deb, since Charlie Brown went to the bench with that foul, it's been a West Virginia run. Here's Ahmad inside to Kanate. 10 on the shot clock. West in the corner. Good hustle by Bynum. And we've got a foul on the floor. That's going to go on Brandon Knapper. Wow, that's a tough one right there. I thought Napper may have been in legal guarding position. He certainly was there in time. Well, most coaches, veteran or not, are loath to hand the keys to the team over to a freshman point guard. But Jared Bynum, so far in the early part of the season, has got a long leash. He has 10 points in this game, had four assists against UCF. He's the only player on this roster that is not 20 years or older, Deb. <laughs> yeah, Coach Martelli was joking with us before the game about how they have uh, sophomores and freshmen in their lineup, yet they're one of the older teams and they're right. called veteran. St. Joe's just seven for 15 from the free throw line. We wonder if that's gonna come back to haunt them in a close game like this. Amon knocks down a three. 
a dozen for Issa Mod, all coming in the second half. And Harler with the hand check. That's a lot of quickness to try to keep in front. And Fresh Kimball's going to have to do a little repair work on one of his kicks as Charlie Brown is now back in the game with nine minutes to go. Yeah, down, down 10. And if you're St. Joe's, you put him in on an offensive possession right here, and, and you, you just have to trust him. Right, you just gotta believe Charlie Brown knows he needs to be on the floor for his team to win. Let's see if Coach Huggins takes advantage of it on the defensive end. Nice set play, getting Taylor Funk an easy look. He's got 14. So West, you might get a free pass on that one just because you've hit a bunch of triples today, but that's not gonna be good on film. Kanate from the nail. And Funk with the rebound. They can make it a two possession ball game with a bucket here. Good deep by Oliva lost it out of bounds. And it's going to be West Virginia basketball. We see you Dean up on the perimeter, Sags. Right here, dead ball closes out, reaches in, gets a deflection. Odd short. Here comes Bynum. Brown. Offensive foul, and that's going to do it for Charlie Brown. The worst case scenario for Phil Martelli and the St. Joe's Hawks. Brown was on the court for all of one minute before he picks up his fifth foul of the game. I mean, I don't know what to say there, except for I wish Bynum had hung on to it for maybe one or two more dribbles and made Napper commit, because Napper had plenty of time to set up, have a cup of coffee, and draw a charge. Well, as good as St. Joe's has been from beyond the arc, they're going to have to be even better in the final eight minutes now with how West Virginia's been playing this entire game. Down eight is St. Joe's without their best player on the floor for the rest of the game now. Here's Harris. And the three-point barrage continues. Impressive. Third three of the game for Wesley Harris. And the lead is ballooned to double digits. See how much simpler the game has become for West Virginia on the offensive end? Good backdoor. It's just become a lot easier to run offense for Bob Huggins by simply putting Kanate inside and allowing everyone else to play their natural role on the perimeter. Watch right here. What a beautiful looking stroke outside the arc. Wesley Harris and the three pointers continue to rain down on St. Joe's. Rich Hollenberg, Debbie Antonelli, the rest of the ESPN crew from the Myrtle Beach Invitational. Now for today's game track, brought to you by Visit Myrtle Beach. And what a turnaround it's been for West Virginia, shooting-wise from beyond the arc. I just think their spacing is so much better, and they look more confident, and they've been able to step into uncontested threes because they've played through the post. And Sagabaugh Kanate, for all the athleticism and the power and the shot blocking ability, his offensive IQ has been terrific today. He has been a willing passer through the double team, and he's been very effective with his back to the basket scoring for West Virginia. And just by putting him inside, it changes all the angles on the outside. I think Coach Huggins has done a terrific job of keeping it simple for his young team trying to adjust without Carter and Miles in the backcourt. And conversely, Phil Martelli now has to worry about coming back in this game with some significant foul trouble for his St. Joe's Hawks. 
Good defense playing straight up by the Hawks there, but the Mountaineers come away with it. Canate, nice look inside. And Harris almost had a chance at a three-point play. Instead, he'll go to the line and shoot two. So this is something that I learned from our colleague, Brian Priscilla. It is called coach's assist. And so he learned it from Dean Smith. So this right here is a coach's assist for Sags because Ahmad should have finished that. Sags did everything right. It won't go down on the stat sheet as an assist for Sags. But when Coach Huggins watches film, it counts. Did you learn about pepperoni rolls from <laughs> Fran Fraschilla also? Because that is a West Virginia delicacy. No, I know I, we're in Myrtle Beach. I'll check it out next time I'm there. You will have to do that. You can drop Fran's name uh, anywhere in, in Morgantown, right? And you can get a pepperoni roll almost anywhere in Morgantown. <laughs> Here's the foul trouble from St. Joe's that we alluded to earlier. Charlie Brown, their top scorer, their best player, is out of the game. And that's really all you need to know with the St. Joe's team now finding themselves down 11 with under seven minutes left. Well, they're going to have to really do a good job of being productive every time down the floor. They're not a team that gets to the free throw line very much. They're going to have to rely on their three-point shooting. Bynum blocked out of bounds by Amon. It's not just Kanate that could get up and swat it. Great length. Big time play by Ahmad. The energy level for West Virginia has been terrific. Their confidence much better. Seven on the shot clock for St. Joe's. Two to shoot. They got it up, and it's a shot clock violation. I believe I needed to shoot that once he got in the paint. Curious that as well as Phil Martelli's club shoots it from beyond the arc, it seems like they haven't been taking that many threes in the second half. Why is that? Well, I think because West Virginia has decided to close down the three-point line. Now, you remember C.J. Massenburg from Buffalo hit nine triples. No one has ever hit nine triples against a Bob Huggins defense. You see pieces of what they will become coming together. They haven't done it for 40 minutes yet, but this is as close as they have all season. Brandon Knapper gets in the shooting show. His first triple gives him six. And now West Virginia starting to pull away up by 14. Bynum got fouled on the shot. He'll go to the line and shoot two. I know. Watch Knapper lines it up. Beautiful. Perfect rotation. Ball doesn't even hit the rim. And that's Logan Rout cheering on his fellow West Virginian, Brandon Knapper. I'm not saying that West Virginia isn't going to still get their mojo and everything from their defense, but this might be a team as the season evolves that they become more of an offensive team. If you can believe that that could be true, I think they're that balanced and they have enough weapons. Coach Huggins has talked about the depth of this team. Jared Bynum struggling from the free throw line this afternoon. He's one for seven from the strike. Young man, you need to get in the gym and shoot some free throws. Five and a half to go. West Virginia looking to leave Myrtle Beach, feeling better about themselves than they did following that Friday night loss to Western Kentucky in the semifinals. Fouls called on Wesley Harris. That's his first. And it's the team's seventh. And that'll send St. Joe's to the line to shoot a one and one. Now Chase Harler off the bench to replace Issa Ahmad, who's had a dynamite second half, scoring all 12 of his points in the second stanza. Is Phil Martelli already knew this. This is not something he didn't know, except the free throw shooting has been terrible for St. Joe's. 
is that they, they might not win many games if Charlie Brown's not on the court. I'm sure Coach Martelli knew that. And, and this is a, a veteran coach who I'm sure practices without Charlie Brown on the floor just so you can get ready in case something like this happens. Foul trouble and he's out of the game. Harris, corner, not this time. And a foul on the weak side, and it's going to go on West Virginia. And that's Kanate picking up that foul. He pushed Kimball all the way underneath the basket. Not that St. Joe's has been able to take advantage of it at the free throw line. Yeah, nine for 20 at this point, with Kimball coming up to shoot another one and one. It's amazing to me that you can be that good of a three-point shooting team and not make free throws. And once again, West Virginia making a lot of hay at the free throw line, 21 for 27. Nineteen for Kimball. His career high is 26. Anthony Longpre checks in, 12 in red, as does Chris Clover. One more free throw coming for Kimball. And he makes them both count. So now Lamar Fresh Kimball is the leading scorer for St. Joe's, 20. But with under five minutes to go and your team down a dozen, they're going to have to start thinking about knocking down some threes like they did in the first half. You gotta stay in that zone because it's tough to match up with them man to man. Underneath. And West Virginia called for traveling. And Barry Mathis called that right in front of Bob Huggins. And he's gotta be careful not to get himself a technical. He is incredulous. Kimball with the take. Beautiful. Split the D. Now you got to get a couple of stops in a row. You can get three stops in a row and score on the other end. 24 for Lamar Kimball. Kanate short. No quit in these St. Joe's Hawks. Funk, shot fake, and the three attempt goes awry, and then another foul is going to go on St. Joe's. And Funk had a great look. 3.30 to go. Time is of the essence for Phil Martelli and the St. Joe's Hawks if they want to get back in this one down 10. ESPN's exclusive presentation of college basketball is brought to you by Visit Myrtle Beach. Relax and unwind on Myrtle Beach time. Well, next year. It's going to be fantastic, and uh, he has a very good fan base here. They love hoops in this part of the state of South Carolina. How about 752 career wins for Cliff Ellis? He's in that Bob Huggins category. Yeah. Hugs with 846 coming into today. We talked about Cliff Ellis in the Coastal Carolina. Chanticleers will be part of the eight-team field next year here at the Myrtle Beach Invitational. Hugs looking for career win number 847 with a victory today. And it will be well earned as Napper knocks down the free throw. Red shirt freshman watching Brandon Napper get some quality reps in the game versus Western Kentucky as well. He's done a very nice job today. Napper's been around the program a couple of years, had a sit out last year after right knee meniscus surgery. But he's a West Virginian, was a three-time All-State player in the state of West Virginia before choosing to stay home and play for the Mountaineers. 
Loose ball, and the smallest player on the floor comes away with it. Kimball, floater. Kimball, what a game. 26, matching his career high for Lamar Fresh Kimball. And he's picked up the scoring slack since Charlie Brown went to the bench with eight minutes to go, but might be too little too late with 2.51 to go and West Virginia up 10. There's plenty of time if you can get some stops. You can't give up that. Lamont West has a career high and a career high in threes. 25 for the junior out of Cincinnati. There's Kimball again. Do they count it? Yes, they do. But Kimball does such a good job getting his shoulders by the defender. Watch him turn the corner right here. Shoulders past Harris, right to the rim. You talk about a tough Philly point guard. That's Lamar Kimball. Went to Newman Goretti High School. That team, by the way, Newman Goretti, has won five straight state titles. Quade Green, the sophomore point guard for Kentucky, went to Newman Goretti. Yeah, they're only giving him one, one free throw. They did count that basket. There were some questions at the table. A three-time captain for Phil Martelli. He's the only St. Joe's player ever with that distinction. And he has a career-high 29 today in Myrtle Beach. A little extended pressure by St. Joe's. Coming up on two minutes to go, 10-point game. And a no-look pass to no one in particular. Kanate thought he could find Harler in the corner. <laughs> it's not funny because Coach Huggins has been very patient with this team. But that's just the third turnover in this half. Much better job by his team. And that was an unforced error. But he was telling Sags that the guy in white is standing right over here. Make yeah. the easy pass. Something tells me that'll show up on the tape tomorrow. <laughs> when they get back to Morgantown. Well, I mean, I want to say it again about Sagaba Kanate. He'd been leaking to the perimeter in this tournament. He had been hanging around the three-point line, and he did not do any of that tonight. He got on the block. The first four possessions of the game may have been scripted to go to him. He got great quality touches inside, and we all know what a handful he is to try to deal with on the interior. Napper, good contributor in this third place game. He has nine points, and that extends the Mountaineers' lead to 11 with a minute 45 to go. And a foul on a three-point attempt. And it's Sagaba Kanate called for the foul, and he's done for the day. And that's a typical grimace with his arms crossed by Bob Huggins. As Sagaba Kanate will exit the game after scoring 15 points to go along with nine rebounds. Coach Huggins didn't say a word to him when he walked by. I think Bob Huggins is going to. I know it could be at times frustrating, but I think you're going to see an incredible improvement out of this team as the season goes on. They were picked to finish third in the Big 12 behind Kansas and Kansas State. And don't be slipping on K-State. They got everybody back. And what have we learned about this West Virginia team in terms of press Virginia? Do you think they'll keep up with it? Do you think he'll scrap it all together? Where do you fall well, on I, that? I think there's... It may not be uh, the 40 minutes that it's been. It might be in pieces that work for personnel. Uh, but you know, that's the one thing. You don't win as many games. There's a turnover against pressure. Maybe Phil Martelli's gonna be thinking that he should have been pressing more. But to finish that thought, you don't win as many games as Bob Huggins on, on your way to the Hall of Fame eventually without figuring out how to balance what you want to do with who you have. 
Well, Bob calls timeout. He has two remaining with a buck 16 to go. And look who's in attendance today, Deb. Doing some work as well. He's not working for ESPN, but our resident bracketologist, Joe Lenardi, is the radio analyst for the St. Joe's Hawks. So he's been here all weekend. And Joe knows you can't just play basketball. They had a day off yesterday. So Joey Brackets hit the links here in Myrtle Beach. It's what you do when you're at Myrtle Beach. Showing some good I, touch. I think he's got to work on that shoulder turn a little bit. I'll talk to him about it later. Got to, got to close down his stance a little bit. <laughs> I don't want to pile on Markel Fultz, but Markel Fultz, who plays for the 76ers, has the yips at the free throw line. <laughs> no yips for Joey Brackets no. on the golf course, for sure. What a great guy. What a terrific ambassador for our, our sport. Both of these teams, of course, hope that Joe Lenardi will be speaking of them in glowing terms come March. These two teams with March Madness aspirations for sure. You mentioned West Virginia preseason number three in the Big 12. The A-10 could be a little more wide open. And uh, preseason, at least, the St. Joe's team was picked second. That foul is going to go on Lamont West. And Chase Harler and company not necessarily agreeing with that. Nevertheless, Lamar Kimball will go to the line and shoot two with a chance to add to his 29 point total already. Kimball trying to single-handedly bring the St. Joe's team back in it. And it's 30 for fresh Kimball. UCF waiting in the wings. Coming up at 6.30, they will take on Western Kentucky for the Myrtle Beach Championship. That'll be over on ESPN2. We hope you'll join us then. One of the best defenses in all the land, the UCF Knights, led by head coach Johnny Dawkins. Really good basketball team. B.J. Taylor, their point guard, expecting him to have a big game. And he can score he, with the best of them. He can, and he did not score well in the last game. Look at this ball moving against the pressure. And Funk forced to foul. Wesley Harris, so Harris will go to the line. Well, I think we're going to watch Phil Martelli's team get better as well. He's building this depth around Charlie Brown. Good guards on the, on the top of the offense. His five out motion is perfect for the size of Taylor Funk, Anthony Longpre, and Oliva. Now Chris Clover checks back in for Markel Lodge. And still with 40 seconds left, just a seven-point game. Yep. St. Joe's not going anywhere just yet. But as we've talked about throughout this game, Deb, free throws could end up telling the story in the final analysis. Harris knocked those both down. You don't, you don't necessarily have to get a three, but you can score quickly. Bynum, the floater doesn't go. Now kick it out for a three. Oliva got it, and it looked like he was trying to call timeout, but instead it's a jump ball. It will stay possession arrow to St. Joe's. And if you're Bob Huggins' team and you're man-to-man, -man, you switch on everything, you close out on the three-point line, forcing him to put it on the floor. And how about this for Clutch? West Virginia 16 for 19 from the free throw line in the second half. Knapper comes away with it. Here's Lamont West at the other end, and that'll be an exclamation point for the West Virginia Mountaineers. Lamont West, a career day for him, 27 points. Jared Bynum knocks down a three, but it's academic at this point. As West Virginia rebounds from a semifinal loss on Friday night to even their record at two and two on the season. The Mountaineers win it 97-90 over St. Joe's in the third place game. Tune in to ESPN2 at 6.30 for the championship 
of the Myrtle Beach Invitational when UCF takes on Western Kentucky. For Debbie Antonelli and our entire crew, I'm Rich Hollenberg saying so long for now for Myrtle Beach. Now we send you to the Charleston Classic where Northeastern takes on Davidson.